So that's actually all from me. I'd now like to introduce Ed Parsons, um, geospatial technologist of Google, and I, this is a quote, who has responsibility for evangelizing Google's mission to organize the world's information using geography. Is that right? Very good. So Ed is also a visiting professor at uh, University College London and an executive fellow at the University of Aberdeen Business School. And he's given many, many excellent talks in the sphere of geospatial technology. So it's a real pleasure to introduce you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I sometimes do these talks and I wonder, well, why am I here? Because uh, I'm a geographer by training, although I did do... Uh, geomorphology, fluvial geomorphology was my, uh, my pet topic, uh, so I do know a few geologists. Uh, I'm not an academic, I'm from industry, and I'm uh, from a company that's really involved in building mass market solutions that hopefully you all use and everyone that you know uses uh, in a daily basis. That said, we clearly have a lot of interest in big data and processing uh, geospatial data sets because that's important to what we do and that's really what I want to explain uh, this morning in the next half an hour is is our take I suppose on on big data and how all of this technology that's emerging very very quickly can be used by by yourselves to forward what you want to do um, so a little bit about Google and Google's history like all good technology companies uh, we were founded in a garage that's the garage in in Mountain View in California, where Larry and Sergey uh, founded a company uh, 20 years or so ago now. And from the very beginning, we've had one mission statement, and this has gone all the way through the, the life of, of Google, and that is to organize the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. And that still is absolutely our mission, and we keep coming back to that whenever we develop new products or services and make sure that we're trying to achieve those quite lofty goals. And if there's one word that I want to concentrate from that, that mission statement, it's that word accessible. I think we spend a lot of our time in our uh, industry, and certainly I come from a, a GIS, geospatial uh, technology background, making what we do more accessible is in, in immensely important. You know, we often spend a lot of time navel-gazing and developing services and systems that only really make a difference to ourselves. Uh, we need to sometimes look out and work hard to, to spread what we do more widely. So why is Google interested in geography? Well, it, it boils down to this, the first law of geography, that Waldo Tobler, who sadly passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, developed this first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And like all of these great laws, it sounds really obvious when you uh, uh, read it, but actually it's fundamental to what we do in terms of trying to find the information that is relevant to someone in a particular time and a particular location, because that's what you're interested in. You know, if you go to Google and you search for a pizza, you want a local pizza restaurant, not a pizza restaurant in Chicago. And just think what goes on behind the scenes to make sure that we do present you with the, the local relevant results. That filter, if you like, of geography is really important in terms of identifying all sorts of different data sets that make information contextually relevant to you. And that context, again, is a, a theme that we'll come back to. Actually, when you're out and about, when you're searching for information using your mobile device and increasingly Certainly here in the UK, most people interact now with the internet on their mobile device rather than their computer. When they're searching for things, they're often searching for places that have geographical context, their locations. You know, well over half the searches you do, and this is not using Google Maps, this is just searching online, you'll be searching for things that are about a location. So having that knowledge of where things are, how they relate to each other, is fundamental to actually much of what Google does, even though a map may not be involved. And to sort of prove the point, here I am using geography in my email client. I'm one of those perhaps strange individuals that strives uh, every day, at the end of every day, to have no emails in my inbox. It's called inbox zero. It's like zen. You, know, you reach inbox zero at the end of the day. Now for me to do that, I cheat. 
what can I do? And the way I cheat is to hide emails until they're at a particular location that I will deal with them. So in this case, I could say, well, I can't deal with this email until I'm back in the office. So make it disappear. And then it automatically appears when I'm at the office. Or if it's something I can't deal with until I meet someone I know in the office in Dublin, it will disappear and will reappear when I get to Dublin. That is really clever, but it's using geography in an email client. And I think that's you know, where geography is kind of weaving its way into all these services that we, that we make and use. But of course, when we talk about geography, most often we're talking about using Google Maps and Google Earth and the applications you're more familiar with. And I like to expand this into a broader term that I call ambient location. It means, in a simple sense, that we know where we are and what's around us almost all of the time. It becomes something that is ambient to us. It's a, a constant capability. And as such, that's, that's a relatively new thing. Of course, it comes through applications like Google Maps. Google Maps is used by over a, a billion people uh, around the world. It's something that you probably all use every day. And if you don't use Google Maps, you'll use one of the, the competing products because having that knowledge around you is, is really vital. And it's more than just a map of the local neighborhood. If you use Google Maps today, you'll see that there are various kind of flavors of maps that kind of automatically switch themselves on depending upon what you're trying to do. If you're navigating uh, by road or if you're navigating by public transport, the map subtly changes and displays the information differently. If you're searching for restaurants or hotels or bars, again, subtly the map will change depending upon what you're trying to do. So it's a very dynamic uh, situation. And sometimes I think you know, we have um, you know, a mental break sometimes. We think naturally of maps as being static entities, something that you create, put a lot of effort into, you publish, and then it remains you know, static for a period of time. We're slowly beginning to change that view and to say that maps are, by their very nature, dynamic. They can react to real-time uh, currencies. They're something that's continually changing, being updated around you uh, at the center of those maps. Perhaps the biggest difference, at least to the mainstream, for most people you'll meet outside, the biggest difference has come from that little blue dot in the middle of the map. That blue dot that shows you where you are, that comes from usually GNSS signals, you know, GPS, or it could come from Wi-Fi uh, databases, or cell tower, cell tower triangulation, or even local Bluetooth LE sensors. What it means is that blue dot will always show you where you are, wherever you may be, and will show you what's around you. And it means there's a whole generation now that doesn't know what it feels like to be lost. They're never separated from their mobile phone. Their mobile phone always knows where they are and can tell them where they are. And that allows you to go exploring in places you don't know with you know, great confidence, knowing you'll always be able to find your way back to where you started from. And of course, if you want to get lost, you can switch it off and wander around and get lost. Um, <coughs> I do that occasionally. But it's, it's an amazing change. And the fact that that works you know, almost as well indoors using Wi-Fi now as it does outside using GNSS means that this is now a major part of um, the emergency services response. Here in the UK, that blue dot location now is automatically passed on to the emergency services when you dial 999 or 112 in Europe. That precise location is now shared. That's a, that's a huge jump forward in capability uh, for the emergency services. Now, much of what we do in terms of making the map customized and textual relies on us sharing information. And this is where we begin to start to talk much more about the impact of big data. Those maps, those services that we can offer become much more valuable if we know more about you as an individual. Um, and to do that, you need to establish trust. You need to establish trust with the data provider, with the service provider, you know that that data is going to be stored uh, securely, used only in the ways that you are happy with, and have control, have a real sense of control, and the ultimate control of saying, no, I don't want you to use my data anymore, I want it to be removed, I want to take it away. And that's a kind of a, a basic um, level of service I think everyone has to offer. And again, 
with the regulations coming on this year, that's going to be a basic requirement, that you have that, that data portability. But if you share data, you begin to be able to do some really interesting things. The map suddenly becomes egocentric. You are now the centre of the map. It's no longer Jerusalem. It's now no longer you know, the centre parallel of the British national grid. It's you. You are the middle of the map. The map is about you as an individual. It allows you to deliver services like this. This is the ultimate example of where geography is used to make information that's relevant available to you. Here I am walking along the platform at St Pancras, just about to get on the Eurostar, and on my smartwatch it tells me that uh, for the train I'm just about to depart on, my reservation is for carriage 6, seat 56. Now that information pops up automatically as I'm walking along the platform. You know, it pings and I look at my watch. If you think about it, that information isn't really relevant half an hour beforehand, perhaps if I'm in a taxi or on the tube on my way to the station, and it's not going to be relevant to me half an hour later because I'm going to be sitting in that seat, hopefully on the way to Paris. But at that particular time and at that particular location, that's just the piece of information I need. That's what we're trying to achieve by having this contextual information, this bubble of knowledge around an individual as they move around the world. Saying, OK, these are the things you're interested in. This is what you're planning on doing. These are the uh, uh, environmental constraints that are now going to uh, impact on your journey, be they about the weather or about tr public transport. Here's the information that's relevant to you. <coughs> this is uh, a street view image of the Xerox Park Palo Alto Research Center. It's a big uh, industrial laboratory in Palo Alto, not so far from the Google headquarters. In many ways, this is the, you know, the center of many of the developments in technology that we've become accustomed to over the last 20 or 30 years. This is where supposedly Steve Jobs went in the late or in the early 1980s and stole all of the technology that went into the Macintosh computer. So windows, mice, so on and so forth. It's a great story, not much truth to it, but it's, it's interesting. Lots of really impressive thinking came from this institution. Uh, one of the last things that I think came out um, that you know, really was really insightful for me came from Mark Weisler, who was the chief scientist in the early 1990s. And he was talking about this idea of ubiquitous computing. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They, they disappear into the framework of our lives and we no longer notice them. And this is where we're getting to in terms of geospatial technology and providing information to you. They've, they've almost disappeared. You know, we talk now to the devices that we have around our home much as they did in Star Trek. You know, your computer, tell me, blah, blah, blah. We can do that now. And again, many of these kind of home devices are powered by contextual information that is localised. They know where they are. They know the local weather. They know public transport systems, and they know a lot about you as an individual. Here's a great example I saw of this kind of idea of, of ubiquitous geospatial technology. This is an online book uh, produced by Kate Pullinger. Uh, it's a ghost story that you have on your Kindle or your uh, e-book reader. But what it does is the story is updated depending upon where you are and what the local weather conditions are. So as you're re reading the book, elements of your local environment are dropped into the story to say, you know, as it's raining, as it's raining outside, uh, or, you know, the local police names are inserted into the book to make the book feel like it's something about your own local neighbourhood. I find this fascinating. To be honest, Kate's probably not in the audience. It's a terrible book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice idea. I like the idea. And the final example I want to give you, this idea of ubiquitous um, or ambient location, is this. This is my thermostat at home. As you would expect, me being a geek, it's connected to the Wi-Fi. I can pull out my phone and I can change the temperature wherever I might be. It also has a proximity sensor, so it knows if there's anyone home or not. And if there's nobody home, it automatically switches the heating down to you know, an eco setting that you know, keeps all the pipes from being unfrozen, very important for the weather like it is today. Well, that's interesting. So, well, that's just a, you know, an internet-connected thermostat. Well, what's really clever is that it communicates automatically with my mobile device, with my uh, phone that I carry around with me. 
And it knows my phone's location. And it knows my, my regular commute. And it knows that when I'm on my way home, when I'm about 30 minutes away from home, to automatically switch the heating on. And it will do that regardless of my normal schedule. It will be when I'm 30 minutes from home, it will switch the heating on automatically. So if I go out to the pub um, after a day's work in the office, coming home a little bit later than normal, it won't switch the heating on until I'm on my way home. And likewise, you know, my lights switch off if I'm leaving home and so on and so forth. These devices talking to themselves without any human intervention and also building up patterns of my movements. So again, where the big data comes in because that thermostat learns over a period of time how long it takes my house to warm up. You know, the thermal characteristics of my house, you know, it takes about 30 minutes to get from 16 degrees to 21 degrees. It, knowing that, it can uh, plan to use uh, the uh, heat, uh, use um, the energy much more efficiently. Okay. Let's go on to really what's relevant mostly, I think, to this audience, dealing with pixels in the cloud. <coughs> a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, well, not actually. This is when I learned my remote sensing, my Earth observation. Um, many years ago, I shall say, uh, I used to spend time downloading, well, not downloading, well, I suppose it was downloading, offloading data from computer-compatible tapes. If I wanted to get a Landsat scene, Landsat 5 thematic mapper scene, that would be seven tapes uh, to, ha to load one scene. I'd load them up on um, uh, tape drives onto, uh, at the time it was a Prime OS computer, uh, 2250, uh, had about two megabytes memory, um, and had a huge, massive 200 megabyte hard disk. Um, that uh, had to sit in an air-conditioned room, and if the air-conditioned failed, the drive heads would hit the platters of the disk, destroy the whole thing. Um, and where I was uh, doing my research, the air-conditioning quite often failed, and you would find me running across the department to spin down the disks before, before they got too hot. It would take me literally a day's processing to deal with one Landsat scene. Uh, to do some processing, just to do a contrast stretch, just to create a false color composite. Huge amount of time and effort was involved in manipulating data. That's where I started my career, actually, in, in Earth observation. I did my original master's in remote sensing. Time went on. I started working for Ordnance Survey here in the UK, was their chief technology officer. And one day in 2005, my world changed because Google Earth was released. And overnight, uh, it took up about three quarters of the bandwidth of Ordnance Survey, people downloading Google Earth and using it. And what did Google Earth give us? Well, yes, it was a very impressive graphics package. It was, after all, developed by people that were working in the computer graphics industry. But this biggest impact was to make data that was already available more accessible to people. No longer did you have to deal with computer-compatible tapes or FTP servers to download the imagery you wanted to look at. You could go anywhere on the globe and see satellite imagery. This wasn't so much a technological enhancement as so much a business model change because Google acquired the company that produced Google Earth and came with a blank check that said, go and buy whatever imagery that you need to make the whole of the globe available. And that made Earth observation more accessible than it had ever been before, alongside the very forward-looking um, policy of the USGS to make Landsat imagery in, available in the public domain, suddenly made Earth observation much more available. Now, you will know that when you look at Google Earth, you're just looking at mostly, actually, aerial photography taken from visible wavelengths, so it's, it's true colour composite imagery of the globe. But it's made what we do much more accessible to people. You know, indeed, you know, if you work in, in remote sensing or Earth observation now, all you need to tell people is, oh, it's a bit like Google Earth, and they know what you're talking about. You know, it's much easier than it used to be. So accessibility, making information accessible, is really the difference that Google Earth made. It took all of those huge volumes of data that we spent much of our time, perhaps, you know, as researchers, 80% of our time was spent managing data and doing the processing before we got onto our research. It started to remove that. 
Well, it started to remove it from the perspective of mass market users. Yeah, we can go and we can look at where we went on holiday and we can look at our house. But in terms of scientific use, there were still those challenges of data management. And that's where we move on to what I really want to talk about today, which is Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine is a technology that's trying to get rid of those data management issues, to say, look, we've got these huge, um, massive archives now of Earth observation data available. Most of it's on tape and on spinning disks, but we can put that online and we can make it accessible to people and try and broaden where Earth observation is used. At the same time of giving access to the imagery, we can also give access to all of that processing capability that exists in the cloud as well. And in particularly, we can think about paralyzing processes where we can make use of all of the computers that are connected to the internet and in data centers and use some of that processing capability to do computer intensive tasks. Because there are, you know, billions, literally billions of processors online, all connected to the same fast networks, all with spare processing cycles that we can make use of. So the goal is to take traditional Earth observation data, mostly visible spectrum. We started to look at some radar data, but it's mostly visible spectrum data, and make that much more accessible, and try to enable non-traditional users to get access to this information. It all depends on this, our data centers, not all of which have stormtroopers. <laughs> some have stormtroopers, and if you want to spend some time looking in Street View, you can find this data center with the stormtrooper guarding it. But these are the data centers that we use for everything that Google does, be it YouTube, search, maps, and so on. Google Earth Engine is hosted on these same data centers. The data exists in the same places, distributed around the world. It makes use of the same processing capability. It has, uh, it's probably, this slide's a bit out of date, it's much more than, it's probably closer to 15 petabytes worth of data now online. Uh, pretty much the complete Landsat archive going back to Landsat 8. Uh, daily MODIS co coverage, both Sentinels 1 and 2. Um, uh, mostly, as I said, visual imagery, but some SAR data as well from Sentinel. Also things like digital elevation, land cover, surface temperature, and you can upload your own data sets. So even if you've got your own commercial data sets that come from Digital Globe, for example, you can upload them and process them, uh, but you obviously can't share them more broadly. So basically all the imagery that you might want to get access to uh, is, if it's not already there, there's a capability for you to upload it. And then once it's uploaded, to start share those processing techniques across, um, across that, that uh, platform. So what might you do with it? Here's some simple applications. This is uh, Isla, um, Scottish island. As you would expect, you know, a random satellite image of Isla, you see clouds. Um, it's great, you know, this was developed by mostly folks in, in California, and they say, oh, you know, you can easily remove clouds. So well, actually, have you ever tried, you know, the Scottish highlands? And even in the Scottish highlands, this is quite challenging to do. But if you have enough images, and you imagine uploading the whole Landsat archive for the last 30 years, you know, even if you're just dealing in like summer images, you can find a clear pixel, at least in one of those images for a particular location, at some point through the archive. And if you've got all that imagery online and easily accessible, it's very straightforward. It is literally one line of JavaScript to produce a Cloud3 mosaic by picking the one pixel in all those images that is clear. And you can do that at any particular scale. Once upon a time, if you remember looking at Google Earth, this is what it looked like. It was a cloud-free image. But if you look closely, you'd see it was made of lots of different images all stuck together, and it looked kind of bitty. If you look at Google Earth now, it looks like this. It's because we've taken that Google Earth engine approach and produced a cloud three mosaic using Landsat imagery. So down to 30 meter pixels for the whole planet processed so that we have now this nice consistent cloud three image. Um, and that took uh, just about a week of processing to do that. Here's a, another example of what you do when you do that. If you take those 30 years worth of Landsat images at 30 meters, you end up with a 24 terapixel image. 
And this is online now. You can go and have a look at it. Uh, you can go and explore it in full resolution online just using your web browser. And it allows you to go and look at details like this. This is the city of Las Vegas changing over that 30-year period. And, you know, you don't have to be a genius or a rocket scientist to work out um, some of the consequences of, on one side, the city expanding, and on the other side, Lake Mead, the main supply of water for Las Vegas, shrinking. <coughs> Not saying there's necessarily a, co a co coincidence there, but... <laughs> Um, or you can look at this if you're interested in coastal geomorphology. Uh, this is Cape Cod, and you can see the coastal deposition processes <coughs> happening over you know, a relatively extended period of time, but not, obviously not for geologists, but for a geographer like me, you know, 30 years is quite a long time. Um, you can see the, the, uh, the, the deposition as the spit moves down the coastline. That's, you know, that's fascinating. It's great for looking at some of these sorts of processes. But really what you want to be able to do is to get in and do some proper processing. Now, the way Google Earth Engine works is a slightly different approach to perhaps what you'd normally expect. There is a Python API and Python libraries that you can use, and indeed you know, that's possible. But actually to get the real value of the kind of interactive nature of this, because actually much of the processing you will do will happen almost instantly, the, the best approach to take is to use JavaScript. And JavaScript is you know, a widely used and, and understood development um, environment. So there is basically a code editor that runs in your browser that allows you to uh, interact with all this imagery to do uh, processing, <coughs> per pixel processing, to do classification, uh, so on and so forth. And literally, you know, to produce that Cloud3 mosaic or to pull up this image here, this is a um, a sentinel scene of London, just three or four lines of code. Uh, if we have a little bit of time later on, I'll hang around in the library, you can have a chat and I'll show you how it works. Um, it's very straightforward, well, relatively straightforward to use. It's kind of fully documented. Um, if you don't know JavaScript, you can pick it up quite quickly and there'll probably be a JavaScript expert somewhere in your institution that can help you with that. Uh, let's look at how some of it's been used. This is some work by Matt Hansen at the University of Maryland who has been looking at uh, forest change uh, over the last 30 years, so classifying uh, forestry area, usually from creating NDVI-like images, but done that on a, on a global scale. Um, here's some more dynamic examples, some river morphology work from the U University of California, Berkeley there, and some work from the uh, European Union Joint Research Centre in Ispra looking at global surface water um, estimations uh, from Landsat and MODIS, MODIS imagery, again, over a sort of a 20-year period. Um, surprisingly enough, it surprised me, it's actually been an increase in global surface water over that period of time. But, you know, uh, it was in Nature, a couple of, uh, Nature about a, a year or so ago, if you want to check out the letter. Talking about that, how, did, how was that achieved and to give you some sense of the, you know, what does big data really mean? So, if you want to do this, it was 32 years worth of imagery. A image was created for every month, the classification of uh, surface water. So you have 12 times uh, 32 global images. That's 3 million Landsat scenes. That is... Uh, 1,800 terapixels of data, and to process that, it took 1,200 uh, years of computation time. But of course, that's 1,200 years of computation time using one computer. But we didn't use one computer. Uh, we used, I think on average, they were using 400,000 computers to do that processing task. It was spread across um, and you know, loads and loads of different processes. All of that processing, spreading, is not something you have to worry about. It's something that uh, the Earth Engine, as part of its core capability, looks after. You give it the task, it works out how to distribute that processing task over all of those machines. So, if you want to have a play, and I really suggest you do, free for academic and research use, so all of you probably can use it. More than 50,000 users currently in over 170 countries. There are algorithms that have been developed and shared by the community so far. It's very much a kind of a commons environment. 
uh, is a, it's basically free to use unless you really want to pay us and then we will take some money from you. And funnily enough, there are a few federal agencies in the United States that can't use things for free, uh, so we have to take some money from them. If you're in that situation, let us know. We'll, we're quite happy to take your money. Um, most importantly, perhaps, we don't make any claim or take any ownership of your algorithms or data. It's all for you to use. We'd love you to share it with the rest of the community, but that's not a, a major motivator. The important thing, earthengine.google.com slash sign up. All you need is a Google ID. So what you use for Gmail or, or YouTube or whatever will do nicely. Okay, very quickly, I just wanted to go on and say, well, what's the impact of that? Remember I said that the user interface, the way that you use this is through a browser running JavaScript. If you think about it, that means you can get access to these global Earth observation data sets from anything that one runs a web browser. You don't need your own dedicated computing facility. As long as you've got an internet connection and a web browser, you have access to this capability. It means that the next billion users who are coming online using devices like this, this is a phone that was um, introduced <coughs> this week in, uh, in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress. It's a smartphone produced by Nokia for less than $50. So you can have a device and an internet connection for less than $50. You have access to all the world's Earth observation data and the ability to process that. Now, what could that mean for you know, farmers in Africa or people studying uh, earthquakes in Indonesia to have that capability in their pocket all of the time? I think it's something we, we can think about. OK, final topic, here come the machines. You know, hear no doubt a lot about machine learning over the next couple of days. This is one of our autonomous vehicles that is currently uh, driving around Portland, Oregon, and uh, San Francisco, taking people, you know, equivalent of doing Uber, but with no driver. Uh, and this is an autonomous vehicle, it's using machine learning to drive around real roads with cars, pedestrians, everything else, and using machine learning algorithms to make sure uh, it doesn't hit anything. If you want to get involved in machine learning, I think the easiest on-ramp, probably at the moment, for perhaps the sorts of applications you might want to use, is something that we call uh, Cloud Auto ML. And this is a relatively straightforward way of doing uh, neural networks in the cloud, <laughs> specifically focused on image recognition identifying features from images. And I'll show you a video now, hopefully this will work, that shows you how uh, this works. Here we go. So basically what you do is you, uh, the internet connection works, maybe it doesn't. Well, you have the spinning circle. Um, here we go. So the basic idea is you can use this online service to recognize features from images. So the idea is you upload a corpus of images that you train the neural network using. So let's imagine, I think in the example they're going to show you, you upload a series of images of clouds because you want to recognize different cloud types to improve uh, meteorology. So you take a corpus of images that have got different types of clouds and the um, neural network in the, in the, on the cloud processes those and starts to classify them. It doesn't necessarily know the types of clouds, but it classifies them as being, well, I can see these are different, and it extends, then gives you, here's what I think are the different classes of clouds. You can then label them, apply different um, uh, uh, probabilities to those different uh, types of clouds, and then deploy that neural network that you've developed online. Now, all of this is done online, again, just using your web browser. Again, there is a Python API if that's the approach that you want to take. But you can label and upload your imagery and do all of this online. It's very easy to do. I've been, my, my passion is aviation <laughs> photography. I've been training uh, a, a, an auto ML classifier to pick out pictures that have got the red arrows in. And it can do that to 97% probability over all of my imagery. 
all my images. And I, you know, I trained it with about 10,000 uh, photos I've taken over the last years. But imagine you could load you know, your cross sections or whatever images you had and try it out. It's very simple to have a go. So Google Cloud Auto ML and give it a go. It's very straightforward. Right. It's been used uh, recently in this case study, which is uh, trying to identify where phishing is happening from a combination of satellite imagery and AIS data. So if you have a ship, you have a, an AIS radio that broadcasts your location all the time. You don't have to say what you're doing. You don't have to say I'm fishing or I'm doing whatever else. But by applying machine learning techniques to the patterns of movements of these fishing vessels over time, Global Fishing Watch has been able to identify where fishing is happening at any point in time and space and produce these heat maps of where the global fishing uh, fleets are uh, uh, fishing across the, the globe. Finally, and I really mean finally this time, when we do all this analysis and, you know, we get excited about it and we, you know, produce no doubt um, uh, great improvements to what we do. But sometimes it's important to, to think about the broader, um, the broader perspective in terms of what this technology could do to society more, more widely. In 2007, we started uh, the Street View program, which is going and collecting all this terrestrial panoramic photographs around the world. And what we did, as we do with most of the techniques or programs that we do, is we produce an API, make what we do a platform that other people can use. And sometimes, almost always, you're not quite sure which direction that's going to go in, how people are going to use it. Here's a fascinating example. This is uh, Anna Christian Hertz, who's a um, medical professional in Sweden. And she's developed... Um, <coughs> basically a, a, I suppose, a virtual reality bicycle for Alzheimer patients. And they can cycle on this, on this uh, VR bicycle through street view imagery of the places that they grew up as children. And this connects to those childhood memories and helps uh, sufferers from Alzheimer's get connected back uh, to the time that they could remember. You would have no idea that this would be an application of how big data would be used. But there was something about you know, these images or places that you're familiar with while you're cycling, while you're having that physical activity that connects those neurons again and starts to um, you know, not prevent Alzheimer's from being a, 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 a disease you suffer from, but to minimize its impact on you. And I think it's always important to think back in terms of you know, when we're using big data, actually how is it really going to impact on society? And when we make these technologies available, can we make them accessible in a way that people from outside of our community can really make use of them? Okay, that's my time up. Thank you very much for listening.